So, last week on this channel, I uploaded an in-depth 25-minute video about the real 3DO. As many of you will have seen previously, this is an extremely fascinating piece of kit with a hilarious library of games, which had the potential to take the gaming market by storm as it goes, but it didn't. In this video, I will be exploring the even more mysterious follow-up console to the 3DO, which was never actually even released onto the market. This is the story of the 3DO M2, or is it supposed to be pronounced 3DO Mark II? Who really knows? Yeah! Trip Hawkins, the man behind the original 3DO, in 1995 announced the M2, a follow-up to the first 3DO system. This system was initially conceived as an add-on chip for the 3DO system. However, we all know how well add-on systems usually do. <coughs> Mega CD, <coughs> 32X, Jaguar CT. So, due to these market forces, if that's how we want to refer to them, the Mark II was later unveiled as a standalone console in its own right. This platform, however, as mentioned, never reached a market, as was eventually completely canned by the time 1997 came around. The M2 technology, on the other hand, was incorporated into other devices instead, which we shall be discussing later in this video. The original real 3DO stopped being sold around 1996, which caused many other planned developments for the company, including the M2 console to cease development altogether. Around this time period, in 1996 to be precise, Trip Hawkin himself had decided he wanted to pull out of the hardware market. Thus far, after a successful run with Electronic Arts, leading on to the failure of the 3DO, he decided to sell the M2 technology to a Japanese company called Matsuhita, if that's how it's meant to be pronounced, for $100 million. To everyone outside of Japan, Matsuhita are much more widely known as Panasonic. This $100 million was actually enough to cover the huge losses Trip had made with the 3DO. So a sneaky getaway if you ask me. The idea had initially been for the 3DO company itself to license the M2 to Panasonic and Goldstar, who were both in place to manufacture the units. However, after Trip's change of heart, the sale successfully went through to Panasonic which gave them exclusive rights to the M2. This actually became a huge concern to potential third-party developers, who felt that Panasonic would be unable to provide the high-quality development support they'd received from the 3DO company previously. This caused the vast majority to reconsider learning to work with the M2 technology at all. Only a small few would stay on board, such as the developer known as Warp, for example. There were also short periods where Sega were in talks with Panasonic about developing a partnership for the console. However, this ended up falling apart at the last minute. Let's be honest though, the M2 was doomed to fail, and even a partnership with Sega probably wouldn't have saved it, given their track record at that point going forward with consoles anyway. So in regards to this mysterious console itself, you may be wondering about the spec of this bloody thing. Apparently, the console was rumoured to be much more powerful than the PS1, so it appeared as though it could potentially offer huge competition. According to Omid Kurdistani, a 3DO spokesperson, the M2 could generate 1 million polygons per second, with the graphics features turned off, and 700,000 polygons per second with features turned on. Now, I'm not the sort of person who gives a hoot about graphics, but anything would have been better than the disgustingly ugly polygons offered on the PS1 at the time, wouldn't it? There were also plans to make M2 models with built-in DVD players, similar to the later PlayStation 2, beating Sony to the punch. According to 3DO Senior Vice President of Hardware Engineering, Toby Ferrand, the M2 was designed knowing that we would make it a DVD-compatible player. The M2 was considerably hyped by the gaming press, well before the console's actual planned release. 
One journalist gave it an outstanding 5 out of 5 stars, backing up the claim that the M2 was several times as powerful as any gaming console on the market at the time. However, moving forward, the M2 then failed to make an appearance at the 1996 E3 conference. A Panasonic spokesperson at the event had apparently advised that they were undecided now as to how they were going to utilise the technology, as in they were no longer certain they were going to develop a gaming platform. Further to this, it actually turned out that the newly announced Nintendo 64 had more or less the same power level as the M2 which made people begin to realise that M2 was now becoming a sinking ship. In regards to games in development for the platform though, Whoop were one of the only developers who remained loyal and actually created some games for the machine, which had gone so far as to release screenshots of their updated version of D2. This game would later be released on the Dreamcast instead. Maybe Whoop just really liked underdogs. Finally, in 1997, Panasonic pulled out and cancelled the project altogether. They were unwilling to enter the market to compete with the Sony PlayStation and Nintendo 64. Trip Hawkin had advised he felt it was because Panasonic were more of a hardware company, whereas Sony were more digitally focused. They inferred that although Panasonic had dominated the VCR market, Sony were able to throw around a huge amount of money so much that Panasonic simply wouldn't have been capable of doing the same. Sony chucked around $2 billion at the PS1, and Panasonic were not financially prepared to take on a giant head-to-head -head in gaming. Despite the system never being released, development kits and prototypes are out there in the world. One M2 system sold for $2,500 to a man called Thomas Reimer in Germany after it had been discovered for $20 in an American car boot sale. Now that is a procurement. I would love to have that amongst my collection. Who knows, maybe one day I'll find my own. So overall, we do not truly know how the Panasonic M2 would have done if the system made it to the market. But with stiff competition around, such as the Sony PlayStation, the Nintendo 64, and not long after, the Sega Dreamcast, it was probably a wise marketing decision by Panasonic to pull the plug on the whole thing. The only real question I have is, why did they pay Trip Hawkins the $100 million for the system in the first place? What was that all about? So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching today's video. Do not forget to subscribe if you are new here and let me know in the comment section if you were familiar with DM2. Do you remember any hype around the development of this system in the 90s? I would love to hear some of your stories surrounding the system. Are there any other cancelled, unreleased consoles you would like to hear me cover in depth on this channel? Let me know. Also, being a YouTuber with a small but loyal audience, any of you can catch me on Twitch every Saturday night at 9pm GMT. So if you fancy a chat and want to engage with myself on a more personal level, come follow me at twitch.tv slash tophatchat. You can pester me for bloody hours if you like. Yeah! I would also like to give a massive thank you to my Patreon supporters. Your donations motivate me to continue to churn out in-depth content at such a quick pace. Shoutouts to Carl Johnson, Shizuka Kobayashi, Richard Clark, Greg Hooper, Synth Spaces, Kevin Fahili, David Mountfoot, Andrew Bazanski, Atnes Garcia, Edward O'Reilly, Peter Dawn, Retail Archaeology, Laurie Loaded, and all of my other patrons. What a fantastic group of people you are. Thanks once again. Cheerio!